Thank you, Jesus. So good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? We're a most blessed people. I know I've said this before, but we do really get to practice Christianity under the best of circumstances. We just do. We have an incredible freedom, especially in our nation, where we can go. You know, you're not assigned to a church. You can actually come and go to any church you want to without any persecution or hesitation. Now, I wouldn't encourage you to do that. <laughs> you have a... If you were to look at yourself as a tree, there's a specific soil that's going to help you produce the most harvest. And that's what I like in the church, too, as a soil. And that's why there's so many different churches. Amen? Uh, that you, if you have a specific... When people come to church, they're, they're trying to see, are, am I running at the same speed as they are? You know, if we're running way ahead of you, you're not going to be comfortable here. Because you're like, oh, my goodness, they're so far ahead. But if we're running too slow, then you're going to say the same thing, that they're just not moving fast enough. Our vision at West Houston Christian Center is we're a go-ye church. And we're not a come ye church. We're not taking all the finances of the church to try and advertise for people to come to church. We believe that if you'll go into all the world and preach the gospel, I believe that if I'll go to Peru and I'll go to Thailand and I'll go sow into other people's fields, that God's going to bring people here to West Houston. Amen? I'm not worried about who comes to church or who leaves church. I'm, I'm concerned about doing the will of God. Amen? And I, I will stand before him one day and give an accounting for what I've done. And uh, I'm going to say, Lord, I can't say that I was perfect, but Lord, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And he who believes and is baptized shall be saved. Now, what we're doing this morning is discipleship. We're getting taught. We're getting learned up on the things of God. And what really Sunday morning should be is that as you've been reading your Bible and I've been reading my Bible, it should be a confirmation of things that you're already reading. Don't you love it when that happens? Don't you love it when you're like, you know what, Pastor, that's exactly what the Lord has been saying to me. That's how church should really be because we are all of the same body. We're all part of the same body and we should be listening and we should be hearing together. Now, I do love coming to church and getting a revelation like, man, I've never heard that before. That's powerful. Amen. Amen. And that's why we do want to come to church. Pray for me. Do you want good sermons? Yes. You have a vested interest in that. Pray for me. Oh, Lord, well, let me qualify that. Don't pray, oh, Lord, let it be short. Oh, Lord, let it be quick. Oh, Lord. Let him not drone and drone and drone along. Hallelujah. Father, thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, for this time. Uh, I just plead the blood of Jesus over us. And thank you for your impartation in this holy, holy word in Jesus' name. Amen. We have been talking a lot about restoring our souls. And our soul is unfortunately kind of where we live. You know, when Adam and Eve were created by God, they were created as spirit beings. Their spirit led in everything that they did. I would dare to say that Adam and Eve were more comfortable in the unseen world than they were in the seen world because they were a spirit being first. They, the, the soul was really only supposed to be some sort of a GPS system, kind of like your car. You just put in the information and your GPS takes you where you're supposed to go. It did not make decisions and choices for you. You programmed it. And we had this body that was covered in the very glory of God. But when they partook of a fruit which they were not supposed to, when they disobeyed God, when they were deceived, then all of a sudden the spirit died. That GPS system, it took over. And now man was completely and totally led by their five physical senses. Now, good news, amen? Every one of us in this room who's made Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior, our spirit came back alive, amen? amen. We're alive to God. Say, I'm alive to God. Alive to God. My, spirit My spirit is alive to God, alive to God. and it's perfect. it's perfect. You know, that's the only thing we can look in the mirror and say is perfect. There is nothing else you can look in the mirror and go, you know, that's pretty perfect. <laughs> Because it's not. There is no other perfection in all the world other than your spirit. 
that spirit became perfect. But here's the issue, is that we've had thousands of years of conditioning in our souls, and now we have to renew our minds so that once again, our spirit is making decisions for us and not our soul. That's the big deal. How many of us have made decisions from our soul? How many of you have ever made a decision that you regretted making? Don't look next to you. Don't look around you. Whatever you do. Well, if you made a decision that you regretted, that means that the decision was made by the soul, not the spirit. Because you'll never regret a decision you make by the spirit. Because that's where the anointing of God is, and that's where the blessing is. Now, the spirit decisions, that's where the impossible is. That's where you walk on water. That's where miracles are. That's where all the fun stuff of God is. It's in the spirit. But we live in a world where we are bombarded, listen to me, as Americans and in those that are living in America, we are bombarded 24-7 with so many different opinions and so much bad news. I couldn't tell you the last time I watched local news because it's horrible. You could take the news and replay it every night and it wouldn't change. How many men died last night in Houston over nothing? Over nothing over stupid things. How many stray bullets hit a 12-year-old little boy and took his life? Folks, we don't live in a world that's comfortable or good. And our soul, it's a sponge, and it just pulls in all of this stuff and all of this stuff. So that's why I like the 23rd Psalm. He restores my soul. Amen? He restores my soul. Let's go to Psalm chapter 42, verse 7. Psalm 42, verse 7, and this fits so perfectly with even kind of what the Lord has already done here this morning. It says, Deep calls unto deep at the noise of your waterfalls, all your waves and billows have gone over me. Read that again. Deep calls unto deep. At the noise of your waterfalls, all of your waves and billows have gone over me. From the deepest part of my soul, God answers from the deepest part of his spirit. That's what was happening this morning as people were crying out. They were crying out, deep calls to deep. And there are some of us in this room that may have some issues that we're crying from a little bit of a deeper spot because, folks, we were... We were lost. We were deep, deep, deep. Not just, not just lost, but I mean just living deep away from God. And God blessed us and God saved us and delivered us. And it's from that deepness that I cry out to him. And from the deepness of my soul, he answers from the deepness of his spirit. Every person in this room, you should be full right now. You should be full. Your spirit should be full right now because of what God has already done this morning. But just like you already had a meal today, are you going to eat tomorrow? See, we want to stay in that place of fullness. And the way that we do that is we feed on the Word of God. We keep the Word in front of our eyes. We keep the Word coming out of my mouth. I keep the Word coming out in, into my ears. I want to constantly live my life where I have a constant flow. I need to hear what God says. I would dare to say that if I were to take a poll in this room of what the number one issue for every believer is or what the number one thing that most believers struggle with is hearing God's voice. Would you agree with that? How many of you in the room would say, you know what, Pastor, I struggle with it? I struggle with it. Amen? We all want to hear his voice. We all want to be led. I'm like, God, I, I don't want to do anything except what you tell me to do. I don't want to do anything except what I want to hear you. And you know what? It's a still, small voice. It's, it's not in the whirlwind. It's not in the earthquake. It's not in the lightning. It's not in the thunders. And do me a favor, ladies and gentlemen. Let's quit praying, God, open a door or shut a door. Let's get to the point where I don't need something from the outside to tell me that God has moved. Let's get to the point where I get on the inside that I know that God has moved. Let me sense in my spirit because I'm so close to the Lord that when I need to make a decision, I'm not trying to put a fleece out because that's really what a New Testament fleece is. Is Lord, if it be your will, you know, open this door or shut this door. 
I want to know in the spirit, Lord, you tell me. You tell me which door. I don't need you to open or close one. I need you to show me which one because when you know the door, you're there. You're going to walk through that door and all the provision and there's no wandering and wandering and all that kind of stuff that goes along with it. I really love Jeremiah chapter 17. Let's go there real quick. Jeremiah chapter 17. And I've been trying to get for weeks to this one account of Jesus. Jeremiah 17, 7 says, Blessed is the man whose trust is in the Lord and whose hope is the Lord. Go to the next verse. For he shall be like a tree planted by the waters, which spreads out its roots by the river, and will not fear when heat comes, but its leaf will be green and will not be anxious in a year of drought. Why is it so important that my soul is refreshed? Why is it so important that my spirit is strong? Because there are going to be situations that we get put in where when we get squeezed, and if we are, don't have a soul that's strong, what's going to come out of us is not going to be good. Or as my father would say, no bueno por nada. It is not going to be good. Have you ever been squeezed? Were you, were you amazed at the word that came out of your mouth when you got squeezed? Has everybody ever thought you got delivered from profanity? You know, I don't cuss and I don't say anything, but you hit your finger with that hammer, whatever is rooted deep, deep, deep inside of you, she's a coming out. I have been amazed. It's like, Lord, I've been saved for 32 years. But yet the amounts of pressure that can be applied to our souls when it's not strong or when our spirit is not strong and what's still the stuff that can come out of us, I'm amazed. Don't ever think that you are perfect. <laughs> Amen. Duh. So what this verse is talking about is that we're like a tree planted by the streams of water. And that tree by the streams of water, whenever there's a drought, whenever that water source goes dry, it has to have some sort of a root system that can touch and tap in to a hidden source of water beneath. That's what you and I have to do. We have to learn how to live from a different source. We have to learn how to eat from a different table. We have to learn to, to, to understand what is, the real, what is the most important thing. I would dare to say that in each and every one of our lives, putting God's word first place is the most important thing that you can do on a daily basis. Spending time with God every day, spending time in your Bible, Every day is the single most important thing that you can do. It is your first line of protection. It's your first line of hearing God's voice. It's your first line of revelation. And trust me, I've never come away from the table feeling worse, only better. But you know what? It's a discipline. This is the thing about the soul. It has to be disciplined. That's why Jesus said, go and make disciples. Because he knew that our spirits were perfect, but our soul was mush. Our soul, the heart, can be deceived. We can be deceived. It is obvious that we can be deceived. And only someone that has a strong spirit and a strong soul, when that temptation comes, when that deception comes, that you can recognize it and turn something out of a bad situation into a good situation. Amen? Let's look at this account. Let's go to the book of John. John chapter 4. John chapter 4, let's begin in verse, uh, it's actually 1 through 34, and we're not going to read the whole thing, but let's begin in verse... Um, and this is talking about Jesus. So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey. What? Jesus got tired? 
I thought Jesus was God. I thought Jesus could do whatever he wanted. I thought Jesus was a superhero. No, Jesus was all God and he was all man. And he came to earth just like you and I. And believe it or not, yes, even Jesus got tired. Even Jesus got weary. Have you ever been tired? Have you ever been wearied? Amen. So Jesus was like, disciples, you guys go along. Well, let me just continue reading. Jesus, therefore, being wearied from his journey, he sat thus by a well, and it was about the sixth hour. A woman of Samaria came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy, wood, to buy food. Now, let's set this all up. You've had a long day. Amen. Anybody had a long day? Have you already had a long day? Don't, don't answer that. Have you ever just had men, wives, workers, everybody? Have you ever just had a long day and you're like, everybody, I'm wearied, I'm tired, I'm hungry, I've given it all, I've done it all. Oh my gosh, what a day I've had. And everybody goes along to go get Jesus some food and to get Jesus some water and in walks the Sumerian woman. Now, in my flesh, I would be like, I got nothing for you. I am tired. I am weary. I've given it all. I've prayed it all. I've studied it all. I just need 10 minutes of just aloneness and being just quiet. But you know what? Even though Jesus' body was wearied, his spirit was strong. What do you do when you're wearied and when you're tired? Is that when you feel like being in the anointing and saving someone's life? No, I want ice cream. I want Ben and Jerry's Chunky Monkey. I want, I want some cake. I want to watch something on TV. I want to watch something. I, my soul is tired. I need to be refreshed. See, here's the difference. Jesus' spirit, he always stayed full. He always had that reserve so that when he got into this situation, he was able to minister to this woman and not just minister to her. He started a revival in that land when he was wearied and when he was tired. Each and every one of us is going to meet that Samaritan woman. And let's just be real honest, a Samaritan woman, and I'm just going back culturally, Number one, she was a woman. And let's just say women were not treated as well as they were, as they are in the United States of America today. And she was a Samaritan. Does anybody know what a Samaritan is? A Samaritan was somebody that had no legal right. They were, they were literally considered half-breeds in, in, in Israel. They were Jews that were part of the ten tribes that went to the north back in the days of, of the kings and queen, uh, kings of Israel, and they lost their genealogy. They could no longer prove who they were or what tribe they were a part of, and because of that, they were exiled. They had no rights. So here's Jesus. Get a picture. You're tired. You're weary. You're hungry. And the AT&T salesman comes to your front door. <laughs> or the magazine seller, or the... <laughs> when we were kids, remember when we were kids and the door would knock and we would knock each other over trying to get to the door to open it? And now when the door knocks, we're like this. <laughs> Shh. We hide. It's so different. It's so different. But all of a sudden, Jesus begins to pull from a different source. See, Jesus was the Word, but he still had to spend time in the Word. Amen. Everything that Jesus did, he did as a man. Amen. Jesus prayed. Jesus spent time in the Word. Amen. Jesus disciplined his body. Amen. Jesus was tempted just like you and I are. He, did every, he had to do everything just like a man in order to be that perfect sacrifice for us. So he had those days. Listen to me. He's God, and he's trying to walk around with 12 guys who just don't get it. How many times does Jesus say, and again I say, and again I say, and again I say? And you've got some that are wanting to call down fire, and you've got Peter who's up one day, down the other. 
you got zealots, you got all, he's got all of these personalities, and Jesus was like, guys, I love you, but you got to go. And I'm going to sit here by this well, and I'm going to read my Bible, I'm going to have my coffee, and I'm going to have 10 minutes to myself. And it's in that 10 minutes that that woman walks into his life. And Jesus looks at her and says, get me a drink. And it starts one of the most beautiful encounters in the whole Bible. And he leads her line by line, moment by moment, into the very revelation that he is the Messiah. And all of a sudden, he begins to operate in the gifts of the Spirit. Because he asks her, woman, where's your husband? And she goes, I have none. And Jesus goes, you've answered rightly, because you've had five, and now you're living with a guy, and he's no good. And Jesus, all of a sudden, she gets spiritual. Oh, I, I perceive that you are a prophet. And she starts talking about worship and how they worship in different places. And Jesus cuts right through it. And all of a sudden, that woman goes back to her hometown, and she starts telling everybody about this man. Jesus was wearied. Jesus was tired. Jesus' soul needed to be refreshed. Yet, he had tapped into something that was so much deeper that that anointing was still there and a revival takes place. That's where we're endeavoring to be. Amen? That's, that's what we're aiming for. That's where we're heading. I don't want to get squeezed anymore and have the world come out. I want to get squeezed and have Jesus come out. There are all kinds of Samaritan women that are in all of our lives, and maybe you've already had an encounter with someone that's like this. Whoever that person is that gets on your last nerve, get them saved. Get them saved. Get them saved. That, they're there for a reason. They're helping tap into a depth in you that you can't get by yourself. Amen? Do it of your own. You'll love it. So all of, this, all of a sudden the disciples come back in John chapter 4, 4 verse 32. And he said to them, I have food to eat of which you do not know. Therefore the disciples said to one another, has anyone brought him anything to eat? And here it is. This is what we need to be eating on. Jesus said to him, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work work. Jesus said to them, my food is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. It sounds like Jesus knew exactly what his mission was. And regardless of where he was, how he felt, how hungry he was, how tired he was, he knew what his mission was. Folks, that's what you and I need to be. We need to know what our mission is. What's our mission? to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. You are never going to be happy until you get into what God has already asked us to do. We are called to be soul winners. We are called to be lights in the darkness. Somewhere along the line, church got turned into something where I come, I sit, I give, I leave. And church stays, we stay the same. And in reality, this is just supposed to be a time where we come together, we encourage one another, we get hands laid on us. Was anybody strengthened this morning by that? There was a strengthening that was taking place in several of you. I could sense it. I knew exactly what was happening. There was a strengthening taking place. It takes grace to run this race, ladies and gentlemen. There is nothing easy outside of those doors. And so we have to stay in a place where I am constantly being fed, constantly drinking from that everlasting fountain. Because there are going to be people that come into our lives, and guess what? They're not going to come at the best time. They're not going to come when we're the most prepared. They're going to come when you're tired. They're going to come when you're, when you're angry. They're going to come when you're lonely. They're going to come when our souls are depleted, and we got to learn how to tap into something like Jesus did and understand what the mission is. What's the mission, ladies and gentlemen? we got to get people saved. we got to finish his work. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm a finisher. Look at your other neighbor and say, I'm a finisher. We are finishers of his work. 
Amen? But we have to see, we get so worn down and torn up, and we work four jobs, and we're trying to make money, and we got this mortgage, and we got these cars, and we're just trying to keep up, and we spend all of our capital, all of our emotional capital just trying to survive, and yet we don't pray for others. We got neighbors that are going to hell. All we do is spend all of our energy on ourselves because that is what America does. In order for you to keep up, you have to do these things. And we miss it. We miss it. Because it was never about that. I don't ever want to worry about money again. And so guess what? I've decided not to. I'm not going to worry about money anymore. I'm not going to worry about budgets. I'm not going to worry about money. I'm going to be faithful with what he's given me to do. And when the money comes in, we'll do what he's called us to do. If it doesn't, I have a truck. I'll go stand in the bed, and I'll go preach outside. I've done it before. Amen? Prioritize. Can I just encourage you, and that's the word that's coming to me. That's really the bottom line of everything that I've been trying to say this whole morning. I really feel like the Lord is saying, prioritize. Prioritize. What is the most important thing? What is the number one thing in your life? What is the thing that you're devoting the majority of your time, your talent, and your treasure to? Because whatever that thing is, that's your God. Whatever you're giving the majority of your time to, whatever you're giving the majority of your thought life to, whatever you're giving the majority of your finances to, that is the thing that's the most important to you. Now, if that's God, praise God, we're in the right place. But if it's not, I want to encourage you, get your priorities right. I have a child, which I'm not going to say which one that it is, but when they were in college. <laughs> Whenever my kids have gone to school, I always tell them about their priorities. Jack, what are, what are your priorities? Amen. And if you ever get out of whack with those priorities, guess what? Our lives would mess up. Whenever you get your priorities out of whack, you know, in our house, it's God first, then Michelle, then the kids, then the family, then the job, and see that? And so when we take one of those priorities and we bring it up to number one, instead of God being number one, if I make job number one, there's going to be a problem. If I make my spouse number one, that's going to be a problem. If I bring anything up to number one other than God, I'm going to have a life that is filled with frustration. Because, God, there's a single place in your heart that only God can hold. You can't have two things sitting on your heart at the same time. There's only room for one. And it has to be Jesus. If you have Jesus sitting on the throne of your heart, if you're making him first place in your life, if you are endeavoring to grow and to be more like him, then guess what? Your life is going to be amazing. There are so many things that God is doing behind the scenes right now. You have no idea of the blessings that God is, is, is doing for those that will be faithful to him and faithful to his word. Amen. You've got to know that it's working right now. You've got to know that it's working. You've got to know that even though it doesn't look like it's working, it's working. Even though it doesn't seem like it's working, it's working. It's working. Say, it's working. It's working. It's working in my life. It's working now. I sense it. It's working. It's happening. All of those things that I've been believing for, it's working, it's happening, it's coming to me. Just don't let go. Don't get out of faith. Stay with it. Don't let go because there's opposition. Don't let go because it doesn't look like anything's happening. It's working. It's working. It's working, Emily. It's working. It's working. There's no time limits to the blessing of God. It's working. It's working. He's working in us. He's working through us. He's working all around you. Because he loves you. And there's not an amount of work that you can do to ever deserve anything that he's done. And everything he's doing, he's doing because he loves you. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Let's stand up. He restores my soul. Amen? Amen? Matthew, it's working. It's working. It's hard, but it's working. It's working. I see it all over you, son. It's working. Working, 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 
working, working, working. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Lord, we don't ever want to let a service go by that if you've never received Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, then I would love the honor and the privilege to lead you in a very simple prayer, which is not joining a church, not joining a cult, but it's becoming a part of the, the body of Christ. So just pray this with me this morning if you've never done it before. Say, Dear Jesus, I want to know you. Come into my heart. Be my Lord and be my Savior. Forgive me of my sins. Fill me with the Holy Spirit. Heal me from all diseases. Deliver me from all addictions. But most importantly, be my best friend. Mm. I love saying that. If that's the first time you've ever prayed it, then we would love to be a part of helping disciple you. And that's what church is all about, is when we come and we learn together. If you're online and you've never said that before, then email us, call us here at the church. We want to be a part of your life too. Yeah, this is not something, Christianity was never to be walked out alone. Amen? And so uh, just know that we love you, that Jesus is Lord, and we will see you next week. Amen? Amen. Amen.